This is an Akai 1700 reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. I recently purchased it locally for around $75. It is a four-track machine, meaning that it can have either two stereo tracks or four mono tracks. Although there are only two settings on the tape speed selection switch, this machine can actually do three different tape speeds. That is made possible by using a bushing that you put on the capstan, the part of the mechanism that pulls the tape through. This changes the ratio between the motor and the cap stand, allowing three different speeds by either using the slow speed, the slow speed with the bushing, and the high speed with the bushing. This covers all three standard tape speeds. This machine does have a VU meter, although unfortunately it is only for when you are recording. It shows the recording levels either for the right or left channel. A really cool part of this machine is the tube amp. It has four tubes, two 12AT7 tubes and two 6BM8 tubes. The 12AT7 tubes are made by GE and the 6BM8 tubes are made by NEC. I'm not sure if these tubes are original, considering the age of the machine, and while I don't know that much about this stuff, if I had to hazard a guess, I might say that the GE tubes are replacements and the NEC tubes are original, as GE is an American company and NEC is a Japanese company. This machine was made near the end of the tube amp era, and is actually one of the last reel-to-reel -reel machines made with tubes. While it is pretty hard to find information on these machines, I can tell that the next model after the 1700, the 1710, uses a combination of semiconductors and tubes, and the model after that, the 1720, has phased out tubes entirely. Oddly enough, it has been pretty hard to find any dates or list prices on these machines, and after looking through old hi-fi catalogs, I have only a guess as to the original price and year of this machine. The only price I could find was for the 1721, a machine that is derived off of the 1700. The price is listed as 1237 Deutschmark in 1973, or 1800 Euro, or around 2200 USD. While this price isn't for the Akai 1700, it gives an idea of where it was in the product lineup and what it might have cost when it was new. The seller indicated that, to his knowledge, the machine was in working order, which it more or less was when I first got it. However, with a machine of this age, problems are inevitable. When I got the machine, the volume dials would make a loud popping and cracking noise whenever you turned them. This problem was fixed by just rotating the dials back and forth you know, 20 or so times to clear out any oxidation uh, inside the potentiometers. Unfortunately, the machine only came with one of these uh, rubber caps to hold the tape reels in place, and it looks like it's pretty old at this point. The rubber doesn't seem to be in that great of a shape, and I have just been using some gaff tape to hold on the other reel. Shortly after I got this machine, after using it for about 45 minutes, the tape transport started to slow down so that recordings that I'd put onto the tape already wouldn't play back at the correct speed. They were pitched down. I could tell that the trans tape transport was going too slow. And that I figured was a belt problem. So I ordered a new capstan belt. However, after a little bit more usage, it started only working on the low tape speed. And after that, I realized that it was probably the motor capacitor, the motor start capacitor, as the motor would only start in the high tape speed setting if you spun the fan in the back. To confirm that the capacitor had failed, I used a multimeter set to resistance. A good capacitor would show low resistance for a moment, then jump up to overload. This is because the multimeter is running a small current through the leads to test resistance, and that current charges the capacitor, and once charged, no current can continue to flow, thus infinite resistance. However, with an electrically leaky capacitor, it won't go to infinite resistance, like this one, and will just read something like 32 ohms. So I also ordered a new motor run capacitor. This one is 2 microfarad like the original. It is rated for 850 volts DC, and while it is larger than the original one, I plan to either modify the mount or just leave it in there without mounting it to the side of the motor, just like zip tie it or something. The first step to accessing the capacitor that needed replacing is removing the front panel, which requires removing the pinch roller, the play, record, and fast forward rewind knobs, and the four screws holding the panel on.
Then to remove the frame from the outer case, you remove the four screws at the back of the case and the four screws on the bottom of the case. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to film the act of lifting the frame from the case as it required both hands and all of my attention. It's likely a task better done by two people. Here you can see exactly how much larger, or particularly in this case wider, the new capacitor is than the old one. Now that I have the case off, you can see what I believe is the manufacture date on the capacitor that failed, which is 1965, so it's not surprising that it failed. It also has a mark on it which I believe is a Hitachi mark, um, and another capacitor in the case has the same mark and also a, another marking of 1965, so that leads me to believe that 1965 is not a part number but the manufacture date. I undid these connectors from the left speaker so that I wouldn't risk melting the wires or dripping solder on them while I was installing the capacitor. I've gone ahead and tested the capacitor using these alligator clips here, and I have also modified the capacitor holder to hold this larger capacitor here. It's not a very close fit, however, it should work to just hold the capacitor in place. I purchased this capacitor from Mouser Electronics. I put a link below to the product page. It's technically a snubber capacitor designed for use in RT switching circuits, but it has proven to be a perfectly fine capacitor for this application. After replacing the capacitor, the issue was mostly solved, or at least that particular problem. I disassembled the machine several more times, chasing a few small problems, and here you can see about the fourth time that it was apart. This time I was oiling the motor bushings to prevent a high-pitched squeal from the motor. While working on this, it became apparent that I could actually lift away the front casing and view the armature underneath, which is a really cool view of the inside of the motor. I was able to get the other end of the armature off as well, allowing me to get a view through the, wind the sealed windings of the motor. You can even see how the spacers used are actually what look like pieces of like wood for the windings here, which really gives a sign of the motor's age. These windings are actually probably covered in shellac instead of a more moder modern magnet wire coating. And here's a pretty cool shot of the armature out of the windings of the motor. Oiling motor bushings was the last issue, bringing the machine back to a fully functional state. After disassembling it several times, I'm quite impressed with the mechanics of the machine. The main tape transport mechanism is entirely mechanical, no chips or transistors, just levers, wheels, and springs. This Akai 1700 is a really intriguing machine, both in aesthetics and history, not to mention engineering, but kind of a forgotten oddity today. I really enjoyed making this video and doing all the research to learn about this machine, and I really hope you enjoyed the result. I'd like to know if people want to see more videos like this, so definitely leave a comment down below if you would.
A lot of the information that I referenced in this video I found on Hi-Fi forums or the website HiFiEngine.com, which has manuals and flyers and catalogs for old Hi-Fi machines. I would definitely recommend checking them out if you have a similar machine or are interested in this sort of stuff. I have also linked down below an eBay page that describes problems that are common to Akai machines, which I found helpful, and some other resources relevant to this machine in this video. I used a service manual for the Kai 1700 and 1710, which I found on HiFiEngine.com, which you can go check out and download if you create an account there. While it was certainly helpful, it contains basic disassembly information and diagrams of the machine components. It certainly is not a complete guide to servicing the machine, and if you are repairing certain stuff, you're definitely going to have to figure some of it out yourself. Although with this machine, since everything is mechanical, it is fairly straightforward, and the guide is certainly useful for doing simple repairs.